Our epistle lesson comes from James chapter 2. Here in the season of Pentecost, we finished reading through Ephesians, and now we're going to read through highlights of uh, James' epistle. James, of course, is the epistle, and in these words of this reading is something that Luther referred to as making James the straw gospel. There's things in here that we as Lutherans struggle with, and I'm going to preach on that and try to help us to unstruggle with them a little bit. However, Luther did lose these, these words of James, against those who thought they could be saved by the law. From James chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, will you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made a distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point becomes accountable for it all. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving him the things he needs for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have good works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you are able. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. From there, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him, came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the little children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For that statement, you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting touched his tongue. And he looked up to heaven and sighed and said to him, Epathapha, that is, be opened. 
And his ears were opened. His tongue was released. And he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Message for this morning comes from our epistle reading. James chapter 2, specifically verses 14 to 18. I've entitled it, What Good Are Good Works? I want to consider, to begin with, three people. Not thinking really of anybody in particular. You can kind of title this people that live not so long ago, not so far away. Steve. Steve is a businessman. Successful. He wouldn't consider himself rich, but he would say he's well-to-do, well-off. Executive in a company. Busy. What does he believe about God? Not really 100% sure who God is. He believes there is a higher power. And this higher power does watch over us. A higher power that, well, if you're good, will put you in a good place after you die. He wants to be in good graces with this higher power. So he does things. Things that we would look at and probably consider good. He helps out at a local soup kitchen. Every weekend, he sets aside time to go help. 
And the people there love him. He's always friendly, smiles. Not only does he help out with his hands, but he helps out with his wallet. He gives a substantial amount of money to support this soup kitchen. He loves to hear the attaboys and the thank yous from people there and other people in the community that know about what he does. He especially loves to see his name printed as a generous donor for this soup kitchen. I'll tell you about a young lady named Cindy. Cindy's a member of the local church. Very active. Cindy is there for many times when they're doing stuff. When they're having a cooking or they're having a dinner, she's there to help. If she's not cooking, she's setting up, she's tearing down. When that church cooks meals for people or for the soup kitchen, she's there to help cook and clean up. Makes her feel good. And she looks around at some of the members of this church that aren't there. She says, what's wrong with them? I know, Cindy says, how God feels about me. He's really happy with me. Every time I'm there and serving him, I earn an attaboy from God. I earn some credit. I'm there in worship, I come to Bible study, and I know I earn favor with him for that. These other people that aren't there, man, not so much. Not so much. She expects on the last day she's going to stand before Jesus and have a star drawn on her forehead and say, you've earned a special place in my eternal life. And there's Jim. Jim's also a member of the local church. Jim's a talented guy. Jim's one of those guys that can fix anything, build anything, really gifted. And he's willing to do that for his church and for his friends at church and those neighbors around him that he likes. Very willing. Not so in feeling very good about helping those that he doesn't know, that he doesn't like. He feels there are a lot of people that all they're looking for is a handout. He doesn't have time for them. Not at all. He thinks God uh, uh, follows the dictum of God loves those who help themselves. And those that can't help themselves or don't do anything to help them, help others or help God, well, he doesn't have time for them either. And they're going to be in a sorry state on that last day, on Judgment Day. All three of these individuals suddenly pass away. And they find themselves before that great throne of justice with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords sitting there. A place where Jesus separates one person from another. You might remember from Matthew 25, putting the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Each one of these three individuals are very surprised with where Jesus places them on the left. They're even more surprised with what Jesus says to them. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Steve, Cindy, and Jim would beg to differ with some of that. What about those works that we did? Steve would want to say, what about all that time I spent down at the soup kitchen? Cindy would say, what about all that work I did at church, cooking and all that other stuff? Where's my star? Jim would say, but what about the work that I did? Do you really expect me to do that for people that don't like me and don't care? The answer is, yeah. Yeah, Jesus did. James has an uncomfortable truth 
uncomfortable for us Lutherans that we don't like to hear at times. Good works matter. Good works are important. James says this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And then he goes on to give an example. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Well, I think we need to define what works are, don't we? And especially what good works are. We might look at works as being anything we do for somebody else. That's good. Anything we do where we use our time, talents, and treasures for somebody else, yeah. But God has a little bit greater definition of what good works are. Good works are not only what we do for others, it matters what our heart attitude is when we do them. God wants us to serve from an unselfish heart. Not one that sits there and says like a little petulant teenager, I don't wanna... We should do them motivated by love for God and love for one another out of obedience. Willing to be a sad, to do a sacrifice, a sacrifice of our time and our talents and our treasures. That means when we do good work sometimes it's going to hurt. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to be at times that you'd really rather be somewhere else and doing something else Yeah, good works are done for our neighbors and our friends. But not just them. Good works are supposed to be done for those that you may not like very much. Even those people you consider to be your enemies. James says this, Good works are done to fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. James quoting Jesus right here. That should be our motivation to do good works. Love. Not a love based on you're nice to me and I'm going to be nice to you. A love based on sacrificial and unconditional love of Christ. I'm going to do them for you even if you don't like me. Even if you can't help me. Even if I wonder if you're worthy or not. Jesus went further and said this, A new commandment I give you, that you are to love one another just as I have loved you, you also are supposed to love one another. How has Jesus loved you? How has he loved me? He didn't wait for me to be kind to him. He didn't wait for me to do anything for him. He loved me first and continues to love me. Even when I fail him in my works and my attitude. Even though I can't really do anything for him, what does he need from me? As Luther said, God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. God commands us to do good works. There's no getting around it. We as Lutherans don't like to think about that. We're all about by grace through faith, and that is certainly true. But works are important. And when you look at how God defined good works, can you see how we struggle to do them? We struggle with our heart attitude. That I don't want to do this. Or not for them. For this guy, maybe. But not for them. Not now. I've got other things to do. Let somebody else do that. We struggle. We do things that we might say are good works 
But don't they always, don't always in our heart, don't we always have that sinful part? That sinful part that wants acclamation for it. We want people to know what we're doing. We want to hear the attaboys and we want to hear the thank yous. We want to do it for people that can do things back for us. We can't help it. If you remember our gospel reading from last week, Jesus talked about the problem. It's our sinful heart. Sin exists here and it pours out through my thoughts and my words and my actions. I can't help it. It comes. And it infects my works that I would like to be good and taints them. But let's say, let's say for the cause of argument that you could actually do a truly good work from an unselfish heart good. What about all those other works that you've done that are from a selfish, sinful heart? What about all those times you refuse to help somebody because you don't like them, because they're your enemy, because they can't help you? What about all those missed opportunities? Missed because you were so focused on yourself, you couldn't see the person that God put in front of you to help. That one good work, is that going to cover over all these other times that you failed? No, it won't. Like Steve, like Jim, like Cindy, if you come before the throne of God and think your works are going to get you anything, they are not. Good works are important, but they will not save you. James says, for whoever fail, keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become guilty of them all. One bad work condemns you, and we certainly do more than one bad work. Whose good works can save us? The man with the nail prints in his hands. It's his work that we rely on. The man whom God sent to earth because he knew we could never be good enough to earn anything in front of him. Favor now or eternal favor to come. So we sent Jesus and Jesus in his life showed us what it's like to do good works. Works that were unselfish, not for himself, but for other people. Out of love for them. Even when it was inconvenient for him. Even when he was tired. He even forewent food to talk to people about God and to give them the gospel and bring them into his kingdom. Every single day. Every day of his life, he did truly good works. And what's the greatest work? When he went to the cross and took your sins and suffered and died in your place. To take from you all of those times, all of those selfish ways that you don't do truly good works, to remove them from your life and your record. He took them to the cross and died to remove them and rose again so that you could know you are forgiven. The greatest work. He did it. And he did it for all men, even for those that hated him, even for those that didn't believe in him, and even for you. He did it out of love for you. Because he knew you could never do enough to earn your way into his kingdom. So he did it for you and gives it to you as a gift of the Holy Spirit by grace through faith. It is yours. You get the credit for all of those good works that Jesus did in his life. They are now assigned to you. Even though you can't do them on your own, they are assigned to you and your name is put on them. That's why God can look at you right now in your failure to serve your fellow man and say, you are in right standing with me. Not because of your works, not because of what you do, but because of everything Christ did for you and gives to you. He gives to you his right standing. That's why. When you stand before the throne of judgment, that's why you'll be on the right-hand side. Not because of what you do, but because of what Christ has done for you and continues to give you. 
How do you get these, this credit? It's applied to your life through the means of grace. Poured into your life in your baptism, continually renewed through this very message that I'm preaching to you, through the sacrament, through God's word, continued to pour in your life to remind you good works are important. You don't do them. Christ did them for you. He forgives you. So as you look at your life, and you should look at your life, look at the kind of works that you do. If you're honest, you're going to find they fall short of being what God declares to be a good work. I'm sorry, but that's true. It's true in your life, and it's true in mine. But that's okay. I can confess those things to God because his answer back is, you are forgiven for that and for them all. And you have my right standing with God, my forgiveness that I earn for you, Life with me now and eternal life to come. My gift to you. It'd be great if I could tell you that once you become a Christian, you're going to start to do good works all the time. Not true. Your works are going to continue to be faulty. You're going to continue to struggle with that now and until the day Jesus calls you home. Does that mean we should just give up? Not bother to do good works? Let's consider one more person. I'm going to call her Jane. Jane was a member of the same church as Cindy and Jim. Jane worked a lot. She was somebody that lived paycheck to paycheck, so she had to work a lot. She struggled to find time for the things that she knew she should be doing for the church and for her neighbors. She felt guilty about it. She wished that she could give money in place of her time, her talents that she couldn't give, but that was a struggle for her too, yet she tried to do the best she could. She tried to serve when she could. She was one of those people that Cindy would look at and say, God doesn't like her. She doesn't do enough. She knew that and she felt bad about it. She knew there were opportunities presented to her that she could help people and she refused. Sometimes because she just couldn't, other times because she was too tired, other times because she just simply didn't want to. Other times she did go and help, but in her heart was always, oh, I really don't want to go. I really don't want to be doing this. <clears throat> Yet each time she examined her life and saw those ways that her works and deeds fell short of what God requires, she turned to him in confession and prayer. Thought about them when she came to worship, thought about them outside of worship, asked his forgiveness, and by that faith that was given to her in baptism, knew that Jesus forgave her for all of them. What will she hear on the last day? On the right-hand side, she will hear Jesus say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared from you for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. If we went on reading this, we're going to find those people say, when did we do these things? And Jane would be saying that as well. Jesus responds, whenever you did these to the least of mine, you did it for me. People that Jane encountered at work, who not even realizing that she shared love and compassion with, that she helped out not to be saved, not to earn pl place with God, but just because the Spirit moved her heart. Did she always do them with a true heart? No. She would sit with people sometimes and say, I really don't have time for this, but she would make herself do it. Were they truly good works? No. But she got credit for Christ's truly good works, truly good service. Why is she on the right-hand side? Why is she being welcomed to eternal life? Once again, not because of anything that she did, because of everything Jesus did for her and gave to her by grace through faith. What good are good works? 
James says, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And that certainly is true. The thing is, faith is never by itself. Saving, repentant faith in Christ always has works. Always has good works. Are they perfect in this world? No, they are not. Will you ever be perfect in it? No, you will not. But as forgiven Christians with repentant faith, every time we realize we failed, we turn to him and confess and repent, and his answer is, you are forgiven. Go now and sin no more. And we go and make the best effort we can. Realizing it's never going to be perfect, but that's okay. Christ was perfect for us. When we go and we do works in his name, we give a witness, a wonderful witness. Jesus with skin on, supporting our witness of our mouths with our hands for all people, even those we don't like, even those that can't, and especially those that can't help us. We do it down at Franklin Avenue Mission. We do it here at church. You do it in your vocations. Wherever you go in your, this world where God calls you, you do it. And you don't do it perfectly, but you're forgiven. So we turn to Christ and we pray to him. Forgive our failures. Encourage us to be your witness. Encourage us to do works that are pleasing. And Lord Jesus, by your righteousness, cleanse those things that aren't. May that be the faith that you hold on to and the faith that I hold on to. May his love be the motivation for your works. And when it fails, his forgiveness abounds grace upon grace upon grace. Now and every day and all the way to eternal life to come.